The purpose of this module is to introduce all of the techniques and methods used to model the wireless channel. And as we're going to see, this is a very large module because there are a lot of different unique characteristics of the wireless channel that affect wireless system performance and therefore need to be modeled in an accurate way. So we will be using this module to introduce the statistical channel models used by physical air communication systems people to model the radio propagation channel. One point that is important to clarify at the very beginning of this module is that we will be presenting a top-down method for modeling the wireless channel. And so we'll be using a combination of random statistical models and deterministic equations to represent radio channel propagation. Now, fundamentally, radio signals are not random. So, when a radio signal leaves the transmit antenna, we can use Maxwell's equations to model its propagation. And, assuming that we had a perfectly accurate 3D model of the propagation environment, we could use those same equations to figure out how the radio waves would interact with their environment, bounce off the walls, for example, and what the signals would look like when they arrived at the receiver. If we did that, that would be what would be known as a bottom-up model because we would be taking the fundamental waves and using the wave equations to figure out what the signal was like at the receiver. There are some techniques that follow this bottom-up method. One of the most popular is something that's known as ray tracing and Ray tracing essentially uses optical approximations for radio signals and simulates a series of rays leaving the transmitter antenna location. It then incorporates a detailed two-dimensional, sometimes three-dimensional model of the propagation environment to predict how those rays will bounce off walls and interfere with, uh, with each other in order to predict what the signal looks like at the receiver. Now, while there is a lot of activity in ray tracing, and you'll find a lot of literature on this subject, there are some disadvantages to this approach that make most wireless system designers look to top-down models to model the, uh, the effects of the, of the wireless channel. One of the disadvantages of ray tracing is that, first of all, you need a very, very detailed map or three-dimensional model of the propagation environment to predict what is going to happen to the radio waves in that environment. The second disadvantage is that ray tracing is very, very specific. So you can generate or predict the propagation for a particular environment that you've got represented in the simulation, but if you want to predict performance in a different environment, you have to conduct a whole new simulation. And the third disadvantage of ray tracing is that usually the simulations take quite a long time because you have to simulate a fairly large number of rays in order to get accurate results and uh, that takes a fair bit of computation. So as a result, it's more common to use top-down models that, as we're going to see, are based partly on our understanding of the physical environment, but mostly on empirical measurements, so actual measurements of radio signals in the environment. These top-down models are specific to environment, but they tend to be a lot more general than, for example, a ray tracing model might be. So, for example, Rather than having a prediction of the performance of radio signal propagation in a particular neighborhood, we would instead use, for example, um, a top-down model that might be called the outdoor residential area model. Now, this model isn't going to predict exactly the propagation conditions, exactly the received signal strength, that you'll experience in a particular neighborhood, but it's hoped that on average, the top-down outdoor residential model will predict 
the same sorts of average behavior that you would experience if you moved through um, you know a large number of representative outdoor residential environments so the, the key thing is these top-down models try to represent propagation conditions on average as we're going to see also top-down models can contain both deterministic and random components and we'll talk about that as we get into the material in more detail as we will see virtually all modern wireless communication systems utilize multiple antennas at either the transmitter receiver or sometimes both the purpose of these antennas is to improve performance so it improves the reliability of a wireless system and it also can improve the throughput or the data rate of the wireless system to clarify what type of multiple antenna system we're looking at we tend to divide them into four different categories the first category is the SISO system which stands for single input single output system which means the wireless link uses a single transmit antenna and a single receive antenna an example of a SISO system might be a wireless system that is physically constrained to use only a single antenna at the transmitter and the receiver and so an example of this might be a wireless sensor network Wire wireless sensors are envisioned as very small wireless devices that physically cannot accommodate more than a single antenna. The SISO radio link actually also represents a good proportion of the downlinks or the base station to mobile links in cellular networks. So most cellular telephones today still utilize a single antenna mainly due to size and cost constraints and a good proportion of the cellular telephone base stations out there still utilize only single antenna transmission and so a SISO link represents base station to mobile transmission in a lot of cellular scenarios. The second scenario is or the second category of systems are SIMO systems, which are single input multiple output systems. So here we have a single transmit antenna and multiple receive antennas. A great example of a SIMO wireless link is the uplink of a cellular telephone system. So for many, many years, all cellular telephone base stations, while many of them transmitted with a single antenna, they would receive with two. And so when a single antenna base station trans or sorry when a single antenna mobile transmits to a dual antenna base station that is an example of a SIMO link multiple input single output MISO systems are where we have more than one transmit antenna and only a single receive antenna this type of situation could occur for example in the downlink of more modern cellular telephone networks so more modern cellular telephone standards will transmit with two or more antennas on the downlink and still you know as we were saying many mobiles are are single antenna devices and so a multiple antenna cellular telephone base station transmitting to a single antenna mobile would be an example of a MISO radio link And finally, a MIMO link, which is a multiple transmit antenna, multiple receive antenna link, is probably most commonly represented by wireless LAN scenarios. So, for example, now 802.11n wireless LAN products are being widely deployed, and many of in many of these products we have a base base station or access point with multiple antennas and we have a client or a user device with multiple antennas as well and so we have all of these different varieties of multiple antenna systems and because they are so important modeling the multiple antenna radio channel is going to be a very important part of this course however just to start out with to learn the fundamentals we're going to start out 
just by looking at the SISO radio channel and then use those fundamentals from the SISO channel to extend them to the, uh, the multiple antenna radio channel. So let's start with a high level model for the SISO radio channel. As we're going to see, the radio channel is divided into two components, the small scale fading component and the large scale fading component. And as you'll see, even on the topic list on the left of this slide, the discussion of small scale fading and large scale fading is going to sort of divide the, the wireless course module into sections. So we typically represent the wireless channel using its baseband equivalent. So we're not representing it as a passband system, even though, of course, all wireless systems are passband systems. They do utilize some kind of carrier frequency. So at the input to our channel model, we have our input signal X of T. So this is a baseband representation of a passband wireless system or wireless signal. We then are multiplied by two attenuation factors, A of D, where D is the distance separating the transmitter and receiver. capital gamma D. We then go through a system impulse response H which is a function both of the separation distance between the transmitter and the receiver and time tau which is the, the convolution axis and the output of the wireless channel model is Y. So what are some of these components? Well, the factor A is what's known as the path loss attenuation. So A is a power attenuation, which is why we take the square root in our channel model. And A is basically the attenuation or the reduction in the power of the wireless signal just due to traveling a distance between the, the transmitter and the receiver. And of course, as you would expect, the greater the distance, the weaker the signal is at its destination. Gamma is a random component that we call the shadowing component. And gamma is essentially a random variable that changes with D randomly. and it represents large fluctuations in the received signal due to sort of big obstacles between the coming into the path between the transmitter and the receiver. So things like large buildings, trees, and vehicles. Finally, H is a linear time invariant channel impulse response. We do model H as an LTI system that represents all of the multipath reflections of the wireless signal that occur when you transmit it through its environment. Now, this time invariant point is a key point to highlight here because, as we're going to see, it's not exactly true. So, one of the things that we noticed is that this channel impulse response is also a function of distance and distance will change if there is motion either by the transmitter or receiver and we sometimes model changes due to, in, due to that motion as time varying changes. However, the variation in time of this channel impulse response tend to be a lot slower than the time scale of the actual transmitted information symbols. And so from a single information symbols perspective, we still model the system as an LTI system. But we'll get, we'll get into that um, in a little bit more detail in subsequent slides.